Well, welcome back to our class on Jeremiah in the New Testament. Today, we're going to look at a passage that's quoted not just once in the Old Testament, but Isaiah uses similar language and uh, more than, well, mainly Romans 9, as you can see on your screen as far as the New Testament. But the idea of, of God being the potter and our being the clay is a common theme throughout Scripture. It shows us that God is in control. God has the right to do what he wants with each lump of clay, and he is sovereign, and he is all-powerful, and our God is holy. And so as he does these things, we can know that it's the right thing. We can know that it is just, even if it's showing his punishment to one group or another or an individual or another individual being blessed. All of it is God's right. And again, he's going to do things that are appropriate. He is never going to do something that is inappropriate. He's never going to do something that's wrong. And so when we look at passages like this, we can have great confidence that he, as the holy, sovereign, all-powerful God, is going to do the right thing. It's actually, to some, it may seem a little uh, harsh or a little unfair, but for one who is in Christ, this is a very comforting thing that God is in control and that he can mold us as he knows is the best way to mold us. And so let's enjoy these passages today. I've got, I did a presentation some years ago, um, uh, maybe over five years ago now, and uh, on this. And so I've, I've included some of the slides from a presentation when I was doing grad work. And um, some interesting thing about pottery, interesting things about pottery in the Old Testament. And so just a, a few, you might call them slightly random things for today's lesson, but um, it's very enjoyable uh, for me. And I think you'll find it uh, that way as well. So uh, today, Jeremiah 18, 1 to 12 will be our main Old Testament text. And then our main New Testament text will be where Paul is writing to the Romans and, and says the same thing. He's basically talking about what we read about in Jeremiah 18, and that'll be found in Romans 9, verses 19 to 29. So next week will be the halfway point through this, le this class, and uh, it's amazing how time continues to move. But let's look at our main text for today, Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 12. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel, and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good for the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at that time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. And so let's pause here before we read verses 11 and 12 to note a few things. As we've already noted in this study, a lot of times Jeremiah does something very physical to illustrate a point. Here, he's not the main worker in this, but God does have him go to the potter's house, and he observes the potter and observes the potter working on his wheel. Uh, we'll actually look at uh, a couple archaeological, uh, we'll, we'll see a, an actual potter's wheel from this time in history uh, that they've unearthed. Uh, very interesting. But so Jeremiah actually physically goes to the potter's house. He does this. And of course, the potter is the one working and the potter, something gets messed up with his clay. And so he reworks it into something different. 
And what God is saying is that he can do this. This is okay. Uh, the, the word in here that the ESV translates relent is the same word for repent. Um, it's a turning. And a lot of translations avoid talking about God repenting simply because when a human being repents, um, it's because the human being, it's because we have committed sin. And so when we turn from sin, it's called repentance. And of course, God never sins. And so that's why a lot of these translations, they don't want to say when God is speaking, I will repent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. I mean, that just because of our context and because of the way we view the word. And I think that's appropriate. I think that's great. And uh, the ESV could have said, I'll turn from the disaster that I intended to do to that group of people, that nation. And it would mean the same thing. What God is saying is, very clearly, is that if a nation is going down a terrible path, if they are evil and God has determined to destroy them, but they turn from that, they repent from their evil, then he'll turn, he'll change. We see that with Jonah uh, when he went to Nineveh and the, the people there, to Jonah's dismay, uh, the people there repent, they pray, they fast, not just the people, but the animals, and God turns back from the evil he was going to do. Now, Jonah couldn't stand it. Jonah wanted God to destroy Nineveh, um, and God did not do it. And Jonah even says in the end, I knew you would do that. I knew you were a compassionate God. Um, and that's why Jonah didn't want to go. Uh, really, really a bad attitude in Jonah. But anyway, that's what God is saying. So he's saying, though, to Israel, more specifically, if he's declared a kingdom, if he wanted to build up and plant a kingdom and they turn from him to evil, which is exactly what God's people had done, he says, O house of Israel, then he has the right to turn from his blessing and punish. And so that's the real lesson for the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So let's read our last two verses here, 11 and 12. Now, therefore, say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return every one from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. And one of the saddest verses in the whole book of Jeremiah to me, Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 12. But they say, talking about the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that is in vain. We will follow our own plans and will everyone act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. The people were unwilling to turn. The people were unwilling to, as God suggests, return everyone from his evil way. They were unwilling to amend their ways. They were unwilling to amend their deeds. We certainly do not want to fall into the same attitude as the people of Judah and Jerusalem. We always, day by day, hour by hour, need to be willing to turn from the things that are ungodly, that are in our lives. An interesting note in verse 11 there, notice what the Lord says. He says, behold, I am shaping disaster, um, just like the word that would be used for shaping the clay on the potter's wheel. I'm shaping disaster. I'm devising a plan against you. So let's look at a few of the slides from a presentation I did some years ago. Uh, you can see the resources here. You can pause if you want to uh, check out any of these books. The one by Philip King is the one where I've got some pictures in here showing some of the archaeological evidence from uh, this era. Um, as we as we look at some of these things um, in in the previous chapters, um, God has been dismantling Israel's covenant relationship. He's been showing that 
you know, they have broken the covenant, they have messed up, and they cannot rely on the covenant anymore because they have thrown it aside. And now the idea of Israel's election theology in these chapters, 18 through 20, including the potter and the clay. And that makes sense. God is saying, I, you know, yes, I had elected you, I had chosen you, but you're going to be punished. You have messed with that as well. And just because you had that status doesn't mean you are not going to be sent into Babylonian captivity. And of course, uh, they certainly um, have been. And so uh, we're in this larger section um, of Jeremiah 2 to 25, where there are many symbolic acts, um, a lot of preaching done by Jeremiah. Um, and so that just gives you a little bit of context. Um where we are at this moment. This is an autobiographical section. Um, and what I want us to emphasize just for a few moments here, pottery making was a common activity. This is how the people survived back in that day. So some things from Philip King's book, it's called Jeremiah, an Archaeological Companion, and just some various Iron Age II pottery you see in that picture. Included in the assemblage are storage jars, whole mouth jars, a chalice, pot, saucer, elongated dipper jugglets, and angle-walled bowls. So a lot of different things. And a lot of these are mentioned in scripture in different ways. So here is a decanter um, that is mentioned in Jeremiah uh, 19. So the next chapter, uh, this is the type of uh, pottery that is mentioned there. This ceramic vessel varies in height from four to 10 inches, so not very big at all. Um, uh, back buck, meaning the gurgling, gurgling vessel, is appropriately named. That's probably almost exactly how fluid sounded as it was poured out. Since the neck of the vessel is too narrow to be mended, it is a fitting metaphor in Jeremiah 19, where the pottery is broken. You cannot fix that tiny uh, little neck there. And so just um, uh, a little bit more on this. Thus says the Lord, uh, this is in Jeremiah 19, go and buy a potter's earthenware jug. And then he says, in the same way that that broke, he says, so I will break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessel so that it can never be mended. And so that's the type vessel mentioned in the next chapter, the, the chapter 19. Um, another piece of pottery is just simply a pitcher. Obviously, we are very familiar with this. You can tell that the neck is wider. This ceramic pitcher, eight to 10 inches high, held either wine or water. And then storage jars, uh, much larger and no neck really at all. This large ceramic vessel, 25 inches high, 16 inches in diameter, so two feet tall, basically, was used for wine, oil, or even grain. And we have this vessel um, being referred to in Jeremiah 13. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every wine jar should be filled with wine. I am about to fill all the inhabitants of this land with drunkenness. And that's from Jeremiah 13, 12, and 13. And then uh, the last one, besides the potter's wheel, uh, which we'll look at next, but Iron Age II lamp from the kingdom of Judah, this pinched spout, the pinched spout, flared rim, and flat high disc base differentiate the Iron Age II lamps of the southern kingdom from the lamps of the northern kingdom, which have low flat bases. Um, and uh, they, of course, all these have the credits. You can uh, pause the video and, and note those. So that's another type of vessel that would have been used in Jeremiah's time. So here is a picture of a potter's wheel. And this is the pivot part. Uh, this would be the part on top. This is actually upside down uh, from its use. It, the, the top part would be sticking down into a another stone with a hole or in the ground with a hole. So uh, dating from the 7th century uh, before Christ, this wheel was found in the industrial zone at Tel Mink Ekron. Uh, so pretty close actually to um, where they would have been. And this is how it would have been used. Found at Hatsor in Galilee and dating from the late Bronze Age, the simplest form consisted of an indented stone set in the ground with a pivot revolving in the indented stone. And so, and then there's um, uh, just a note here. Um, this is what is talked about in our text for today, Jeremiah 18. 
The book of Jeremiah contains the only specific reference in the Hebrew Bible to the potter's wheel. It is mentioned in the prophet's classic passage on the potter and the clay, the one we just read, chapter 18, 1 through 11, we read through 12, which teaches that the Lord is supreme over Israel, Judah, and all the nations. Just as the potter was able to rework a vessel, the possibility for the people of Judah to be redeemed was still very real. Of course, we read verse 12. Yes, God would have been willing, but the people were not willing. They were determined to stick with their evil, unrepenting hearts. Um, some words in this passage, we've already read them, of course, but some words that are worthy of note, the idea of the potter or a fashioner or a creator. Uh, the wheel, which again is only mentioned here um, in all of scripture. Um, the vessel being made or the article or the utensil. And then uh, the word there in verse 11, uh, the shaper um, also means creator, a, a type of creator, but a shaper. And so, and then in verse 12, despair um, or being hopeless, the, the declaration that there is no hope. And so I want to read, I'm going to read the text again. And of course, you can ignore the uh, Hebrew on the right, but uh, just some of these words of very of, of importance are highlighted. And this just gives you a, another uh, look at the passage, another way. This, this man, Thompson, this is a personal, uh, single person translation. So it says, the word of the Lord, or the word which came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, go down at once to the potter's house, and there I will tell you what I have to say. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was busy at work on the wheel. Whenever a vessel he was making from the clay was spoiled on the potter's hands, he would turn around and fashion it into another vessel according to his liking. Then the word of Yahweh came to me. Can I not deal with you, O house of Israel, as this potter does? Yahweh's word. See, like a clay in a potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment, I may threaten to uproot a people or a kingdom to break it down and to destroy it. But if the nation against which I have spoken should turn back from its evil way, evil way, then I would think better of the evil which I had in mind to do to it. And so here's another way to avoid talking about God repenting. Um, and, and this is fine. I think the ESV saying relent is good. But here it says, then I would think better of the evil which I had in mind to do to it. In other words, I'm going to reconsider. All these things, of course, are ways of looking at God which help a human being to look at God. Um, and these are God's words, so th there's, no, there's no weaseling around them. But the bottom line is God does know ahead of time what is going to take place. And so all of it has a little bit of a a way of looking at things that isn't quite the way God would be looking at it. His ways are above our ways, his thoughts above our thoughts. Anything we read about him, they are true things. They are part of his character. They are truth. But they are put in a way that a human can understand. And so it's always just slightly, it, it's not going to be exactly the way God is. Again, true stuff, but God is God, and we are who we are, and these things are written in a way so that we can have understanding. At another moment, Jeremiah continues speaking the words of the Lord, at another moment I may declare my intention to build or to plant a nation or a kingdom. Hence, I mean, or that's what he had in mind for both the northern and southern kingdoms. As one kingdom at the beginning, his people but if it should do evil in my sight and not obey my voice, I would think better of the good things that I said I would do for it. Now then, say to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, this is what Yahweh has said. Look, I'm shaping evil against you, laying plans against you. Turn back then, every one of you, from his evil course. Reform your ways and your doings. But they will reply, it is no use. We will follow our own plans, and each of us will carry out the stubborn intentions of his evil heart. Woe is what we need to say to that. May none of us 
who hear this lesson live or hear it later, may none of us ever determine that God speaking to us is of no use. May none of us ever get to this point where we say, you know what, God, you can say everything you want to say, but we're going to follow our own plans and we're going to carry out the stubborn intentions of our evil hearts. What a, a devastating statement for any individual uh, to make. So as, as we had with the uh, temple sermon, I've got some applications or lessons for those who heard this right at the beginning when Jeremiah was proclaiming it, and then for those who came back from captivity, and then for us today. So um, if someone was hearing uh, God's word live, obviously those people didn't learn a thing. Uh, they simply reaffirmed, as we read in verse 12, their dedication and commitment to themselves. Um, and I should note up there at the top of this slide, Jeremiah points out that God is in charge. He is sovereign. He is almighty. That's the main lesson from this passage. For those hearing or reading about this when they come back from captivity, I think they might have said something like, boy, the people certainly were selfish. They certainly were rebellious. And hopefully they would understand the importance and absolute necessity of staying true to the Lord. Let's truly listen from now on. In other words, let's learn from what our ancestors, and it might have just been parents in some of the cases, it might have been grandparents or great-grandparents, but let's listen. God truly is the Lord of hosts. And then for us today, of course, we reaffirm the sovereignty of God, and we recognize the importance of being open and malleable. A uh, song I really enjoy reading and singing, we'll just read it right now, is Open My Heart. Open my heart to what you know, so I can stretch, so I can grow. My feelings toss me to and fro. Open my heart to what you know. Open my eyes to what you see, to understand what I should be. My feelings get the best of me. Open my eyes to what you see. Open my ears to what you hear, so I can keep you very near. My feelings make it so unclear. Open my ears to what you hear. And then the first verse again, open my heart to what you know, so I can stretch, so I can grow. My feelings toss me to and fro. Open my heart to what you know. The song points out a lot of great things. Obviously, we want to see things the way God sees them. We want to hear them the way God hears them. We want our hearts to be as much like God's heart as possible. But every verse points out that our feelings can mess with us. And in a grand way, in Jeremiah's time, the people, they they weren't necessarily confused by their feelings. They gave in to their feelings. They determined that they were going to do what they wanted to do no matter what. We must recognize that God's truth trumps anything that we may be feeling. So we look at the idea of the potter and the clay. Both of these, the sovereignty of God and the importance of being open and malleable, are exactly the lessons coming from what we read about here in Jeremiah 18. Now we sing another song. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I'm waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only, always living in me. All right, we do find that this concept is in other places in the Old Testament, Isaiah 29 and Isaiah 64, and then our New Testament passage, which we'll read in just a moment from Romans 9, and then not exactly the potter and the clay, but 2 Corinthians 4 speaks of the fact that we have salvation, 
God's spirit, we have God's blessings in jars of clay. We are actually described, our bodies are actually described as jars of clay in 2 Corinthians 4, and that's the passage we'll end with uh, today. But first, the Isaiah passages. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing should make of its maker? He did not make me. Or the thing formed, say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. So the idea of flipping the human being being the potter and trying to tell God what to do with oneself, it's absolutely absurd. And then Isaiah also speaks of this here in Isaiah 64, 8 and 9. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. A statement of contrition here, very, very nice, repentant, humble statement to God Almighty. We're also reminded, as we look at this passage, of our frailty, and we will now move to uh, the New Testament passage, which Paul brings out. And the heading in the ESV Bible is that God has a choice, and it's his sovereign choice. Uh, so, all right, let's just take a look at it. Um, as we look at the book of Romans, of course, Paul um, is pointing out the fact that the Jews need a Savior, and the Gentiles need a Savior, and that one must come to Christ who is that Savior. Uh, once someone does, then one becomes part of the family. One receives God's Holy Spirit. And in the middle of uh, some more statements about all this, Paul says, starting in 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? Ah, but who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Now in verse 22, Paul points out, you know, what if this is what God is doing? He, he doesn't say for sure this is what God is doing, but he's pointing out God would certainly have the right to do this. And what if this is what is happening? It's all good. And then we have a lot of Old Testament quotes. Um, so the idea of the potter and the clay from Jeremiah. And then he quotes from Hosea. As indeed in Hosea, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. God is sovereign, and God has the right to do with the clay as he desires. Again, as we said at the beginning, the confidence we can have and the comfort is that God does things according to his compassion and his grace and his wrath and his justice, but always holy, always the right thing. And so if we are in Jesus Christ, we can have confidence that he is molding in a way where we will end up in heaven. We just always need to submit. We always need to be humble before our God. So 
as we close out for today, let's go back to Jeremiah 18 and let's read the rest of the chapter. So he continues with this. The, the idea of the potter and the clay, or at least that theme, is throughout the whole chapter of Jeremiah 18. We've read verses 1 through 12 so far. We'll look at 13 to 23, and then we'll jump to that 2 Corinthians passage that I mentioned uh, previously. So Jeremiah 18, starting in 13, and remember what was said in verse 12, the people said, you know, God, you can keep trying, but we're going to do what we want to do, bottom line. So then, then 13, therefore, thus says the Lord, ask among the nations, who has heard the like of this? The virgin Israel has done a very horrible thing. Does the snow of Lebanon leave the crags of Syrian? Do the mountain waters run dry, the cold flowing streams? But my people have forgotten me. They make offerings to false gods. They made them stumble in their ways, in the ancient roads, and to walk into side roads, not the highway, making their land a horror, a thing to be hissed at forever. Everyone who passes by it is horrified and shakes his head. Like the east wind, I will scatter them before the enemy. I will show them my back, not my face, in the day of their calamity. Worth noting here, when the Lord is facing someone, that is a metaphor for blessing. Hence in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his countenance be before you. The idea of blessing. When God turns his back, it's just like it is today in our idiom. If you turn your back on someone, you are no longer supporting them. You are no longer on their side. And that's what he's saying. I'm going to show them my back, not my face, in the day of their calamity. Then they said, come, let us make plots against Jeremiah, for the law shall not perish from the priest nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, let us strike him with the tongue, and let us not pay attention to any of his words. And that's pretty much how the people responded to Jeremiah through the whole book. Hear me, O Lord, and listen to the voice of my adversaries. Should good be repaid with evil? Yet they have dug a pit for my life. Remember how I stood before you to speak good for them, to turn away your wrath from them? Therefore, deliver up their children to famine, give them over to the power of the sword, let their wives become childless and widowed, may their men meet death by pestilence, their youths be struck down by the sword in battle, may a cry be heard from their houses when you bring the plunderer suddenly upon them, for they have dug a pit to take me and laid snares for my feet. Yet you, O Lord, know all their plotting to kill me. Forgive not their iniquity, nor blot out their sin from your sight. Let them be overthrown before you. Deal with them in the time of your anger. Extremely interesting here, hearing these words of Jeremiah, because usually Jeremiah is petitioning for the people. He's petitioning God to save them, as he said, to turn from his desire to punish his people. But now, Maybe after hearing what they said in verse 12, maybe knowing that it didn't matter to the people of Ju Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. With them and their stubborn heart determined to be against the Lord, this may have changed Jeremiah, at least in this moment, changed his tune, so to speak. All right, well, the last passage for today is a very encouraging one from 2 Corinthians 4. Again, not exactly uh, the potter and the clay kind of idea, but talking about fragile vessels, jars of clay. And the, the main thing I want us to note, and then I'll read the whole thing. If you took a clay jar and dashed it to the ground, it would break apart into a thousand pieces. And that's what we're getting to here. Look at the end of verse nine, struck down, but not destroyed. Normally, a jar of clay would be struck down and totally destroyed. But since we have God in us, since we have this treasure within us, we may be struck down, but we are not destroyed. So let's read this and then we'll close out. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 10. 
but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Why? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. All right, next week we will look at Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4, and our main New Testament passage will be John 10, 1 to 21. May the Lord continue to bless us as we study his great word.